and welcome to the School Food and Indigenous Communities panel session. I'll be your host, Zaheen Mohammed. Our tech moderator is Sandra Kirsak. And I'm happy to have on the panel today with us, Scott Hall, Maria Buffalo, Lindsay McCharles, and Clifford Gladue, each of whom I'll introduce a bit further right before they present. I'd like to acknowledge that here in Alberta, we're on, the, we're on Treaty 6, 7, and 8 territory, which is the traditional and ancestral land of many peoples. We should recognize that First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people have lived on and taken care of this land for generations. We show respect and gratitude towards elders and traditional knowledge keepers from across Alberta, Canada, and around the world. And we make these statements and acknowledgements to show gratitude for those whose land we reside on or visit. With that being said, a big welcome to everyone in the session, whether you're from here in Alberta or halfway across the world. I hope you enjoy the session and learn something from it. And a big thank you to our sponsors, the University of Calgary uh, O'Brien Institute for Public Health and AA Pediatric Medical Clinic, as well as the University of Alberta's Botanical Gardens for providing us with garden passes. If you, if you guys have any questions throughout the session, you guys can put it in the chat box. Um, or comments. Um, we're hoping to have a question period in the last 10 minutes of the session. So if you have a burning question when someone's presenting, I'll be monitoring the chat box. And with that being said, I'll introduce our first two speakers. Our first two speakers are Scott Hall and Maria Buffalo. Scott Hall is a former teacher, now district administrator with the Massachusetts Education School Commission, or the MESC. He, work, he directs MESC's student-run breakfast and lunch program, Nanatok Mitsuin, which serves 2,200 students, 400 staff, and involves students in cooking and preparing school meals. Also presenting, we have Maria Buffalo, who is a former student of the Mio Wakalton Education Authority, now the MESC. She graduated with honors in the class of 2018. She's a, uh, she grew up in Massachusetts and attended K-12 on reservation. She's a former film major at the U of A, now turned freelance filmmaker and multimedia artist. A uh, big thank you for both of you, both of you for being here, and I'm excited to hear your presentation. Thank you, Zaheen. Um, you got the name of our program correct. <laughs> First step correct. <laughs> uh, Nanatak Mitsuin means universal school food strategy. It means uh, ultimately means. Um, Nanatak means a universal uh, idea, and and uh, meets you in his food. Um, we adopted this name when we successfully implemented the universal school food strategy. We didn't start there, but um, I'm going to share my screen, and I have a little PowerPoint. We're going to go through some pictures and a bit of a history of our program. Shouldn't take too long. There we go. Hold on a second. Wrong button. Share screen. Okay. Good. You're okay. up, Scott. That's good. All right. So there we go. So uh, Muscogee's Education Schools Commission is is the name of our organization, and it actually uh, legally began in July 2018. Um, that's an amalgamation of four nations. Before this, this you know, the whole school food program actually started about ten thousand years ago with uh, the Cree people of this nation that believe that it was a good thing to feed your children healthy food, right? So this has always been an idea that's always been there in the community, and um, for a couple hundred years, um, it was um, that food sovereignty was robbed by the Canadian government. But in an effort to build um, food security in the community and, and, and opportunities for our young people, we started this Ermin Skin School Food experiment in 2013. Uh, we, we had uh, 32 EJSH students and two staff um, in the beginning. So the, the, basically the foods class, we moved them out of the, uh, the home ec room and put them in the kitchen. And we successfully fed 315 students daily, breakfast, lunch, and snacks in 2013, 2014. 
uh, at the middle of the year, we introduced the salad bar into the high school. It was really successful. Um, and we eliminated the marketing of unhealthy food to our students, um, including removing a candy store that was set up. One of the staff members had a little business operation going, so we kiboshed that. A um, couple of pictures. There's um, an example of a typical day. We had this lineup. Not very COVID friendly, so we'll get there. And me making food. So in 2014, 2015, Ermanskin Junior Senior High School food program expanded to the elementary school, adding an additional 450 students. Um, there's an example of some of the things we make. There's a pulled pork sandwich, which is very popular, and make pretzels time to time and bread. And, an example of some of our dishes and the layout of our of our menu. We we chose stainless steel plates for durability and because the alternatives were plastic, right? So we didn't want to use plastic. Um, and yeah, we've had we've had great success with this with this model of um, uh, food service. Oops. Um, in t the, the following year, 2015, 2016, um, Urban Skin Junior Senior High School a food program became a universal school food strategy because we uh, uh, expanded fully to the kindergarten and we included all the staff. Is that uh, flower on that kid's face? Yeah, yeah, it was, we have yeah. fun in the kitchen, right? So, <laughs> so uh, uh, we up until now, up until this point, for three years, we had fed the staff. They like we made good food, and they wanted to partake. But um, we always felt we had to charge them for it, and we didn't like dealing with the money and, and collecting money. And what do we do with this? And how do we reroute it back in? And so we just, uh, in conversation with the principal and the superintendent, we said everybody, including the teachers, should be able to access the school food program. But the stipulation is that they must eat with the kids. They couldn't take their food and then go and retreat to their silo and hide for the lunch hour. Um, and that was very successful. So uh, on a typical day, non-COVID day, uh, we have students and staff in the gathering area eating together breakfast and lunch. And we built uh, more food partnerships with local producers. So in the beginning, we were the first year we were pretty reliant on Cisco and GFS. And after procuring our own food, we saw like at least 50% value savings. So we um, built local partnerships with businesses and expanded those because we completely cut out the international food um service companies like cisco and gfs and so for the following year we just expanded um we we did a lot more we did some catering we we or we employed the students um in in different ways um uh, to do christmas parties and events in the community and and on top of our regular day-to-day -day, um operations so this is uh, an example of this at the elementary school they came down in waves, so there's 450 kids. We couldn't feed them all at one time, so we had to establish some sort of, um, you know, flow of students uh, in groups. And this is an example of one group. And they would come down, they would go through the salad bar, get their plate, go through the salad bar, eat, and then 15 minutes later, another group would come. <clears throat> this is at a powwow. Uh, students would um, uh, every powwow we would give away food to the students um, there's an example of our salad bars and some of our kids that help in the kitchen on a daily basis who aren't in high school but they enjoy working with the kitchen working in the kitchen with us so there's that um, and the following year 2017 2018 we started working with eight other schools in Muscogee's um, as plans between the four nations took shape toward an amalgamation and that officially took 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 place in in July 2018 but we began in uh, February 2018, um, just building relationships with the employees that were in the schools and, and uh, providing food. Um, mostly I just used my pickup truck. Uh, we, we eventually got a fleet of vehicles because it made sense. Um, we had to get a warehouse for the amalgamation that had um, enough capacity to store uh, weekly supplies that we would distribute to the seven kitchens and 11 schools. 
Here's a couple of pictures of the program through those years. Um, students helping in the kitchen. Here's some of our food students working on the food. Uh, we've got the typical salad bar, kind of uh, students um, serving themselves at the salad bar. All these things are no longer, um, uh, we're not doing this anymore. It's, it's uh, Maria will remember these images quite well. Um, we have, um, just yeah some images of our typical day uh, that we served in the school so um maria did you want to come in and, and 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 tell us a little bit about your experience during this time uh, i'll let you present everything first okay sounds good sounds good so here's some more pictures of our kitchen typical kitchen operations we got um, example of a fruit salad we've got some students working on a lasagna uh, we got typical bread making day um, some nice croissants came out the oven one day salad bar students lined up at the gathering area this is at the high school location um, salad bar stuff and yeah kitchen prep on a typical day yeah this is our warehouse operations uh, that we uh, so we, we repurposed a, a former grocery store in the musketry mall, um, cleaned it all out and installed walk-in cooler, walk-in freezer. And we got a couple of these Isuzu uh, uh, delivery trucks. And oh, we needed that in order to have the capacity to. Um, we also are moving towards using wild game. We have the... Um, um, a local fish farm, which is not quite wild game, but it's it's pretty close. We did this last year. We went out and caught a bunch of fish, and we were supposed to be hosting a UN delegation, and they canceled last minute. I think it was because of COVID. It was right before COVID began, but we did like to continue using fish in the program and other wild meats. So, uh, starting March last year, of course, everybody shut down, and we had to reconstruct our our, uh, our operations and um, we still had to feed the students so feeding students during home or uh, feeding students at home during a pandemic uh, we became hampered professionals so this is an example of our operation we have uh, we sourced boxes from uh, some of our local partners and an example of some of the hampers that went out so we got a produce box and a dry goods box and then we, there would be a bag of frozen meat um, mostly locally grown meat, which is cool. Um, and then um, here's one day in summer we we had a we worked with the nations in other ways. So there was there's four nations and they were all doing different hamper things. But essentially we provided food for all of the operations and we helped out here and there throughout the last eight months of getting food into the homes. Um, and then when school reopened, we had to restructure how we operated so no more salad bars. Um, students have to eat in the classroom. Um, they can't share food. They get essentially a bag with a box and some fruit and utensils. And so everything has to be um, individually portioned. And we just, we never did that before. So we had to kind of start from scratch again. And this is an example of a dish, so we would, of our components uh, and then we would have an assembly line. We started making bagels this year. Um, so we're getting there, not quite there, but they're pretty good. Uh, example of some of our wild game. This is one of our principals who, this is a moose that she uh, bagged, which is pretty cool. And then she brought it in and we were working on the uh, on dry meat. And sometimes accidents happen. This is kind of just fun, you know, like an example. It's not, it's not always perfect, you know, things go wrong. So <laughs> that's about it. But I, that's pretty short and sweet. It's like a pretty uh, general overview, but I'll, I'll let Maria chime in with, with some of her experience on, on her side as a student um, who experienced that program in the school. So I'm just gonna go back to some of what, you know, she might re wanna recall, so. I'll let you talk now, Maria. So going to school on the res is such a different experience um, overall. 
the way it was structured and like just the way the community was. And um, having this food program, being able to go into school and know that you're going to be taken care of by the staff and like your well being is you know, accounted for as a student, like you're not just a student. And I think it's very true. Like I know some of my fellow students um, because poverty is very real on the res. <laughs> like I'm not gonna try lie or anything because that's just the truth. And some students know that when they come to school, they'll be fed for sure, like that is a given. And sometimes that's the only place where they'll get fed. And I think just having that option makes your education more worth it. And like Scott touched on this a bit, but food sovereignty within my nation is uh, delicate because throughout history, sorry, throughout history from colonization, um, indigenous nations across Turtle Island, their societies were structured around that food, around hunting and gathering. And for instance, me, I'm Plains Cree and Nahal, Chief Six Territory, and our main food source was the buffalo. And we, as people were nomadic because we followed that food source. So like we migrate with the buffalo, you know, north, south, however far they go however widespread that is. And that's how kind of our societies were structured around that. And um, of course, through colonization, um, it has impeded on that nomadic lifestyle on that, you know, like it's, it's historical. It was basically what I'm trying to say, like indigenous peoples link to food is something that's sacred it's in our teachings and it is the very basis to how we like operate as a community how we take care of one another and I think this program is an example of that so is there anything else Scott what else can I talk about you're, you're muted, muted. I have a question. What, what did you do? Is, did you help in the program, Maria? No, I did not. Um, when I went to school, I wasn't a food student. I focused on language revitalization. So I, my options class was Cree. And um, some students, a, a lot of my friends were in the foods program and it was pretty, pretty sweet. Okay, thank you. I remember you in the lunch line every day though. Yeah, so. it was wild. <laughs> So she, she experienced that side of it, which is cool. Hmm. Yeah. We'll also have a, a question period in the last 10 minutes. So if you guys want to expand on anything, we can also uh, talk there. Thank for you sure. guys both for sharing your experiences and telling us about the program. Our, um, our next presenter is uh, Lindsay McCharles, who I'll introduce a little bit about. She's originally from Treaty One Territory. She was raised in Winnipeg, Manitoba. She's a visitor to Treaty 7 territory where she works as a registered dietitian with Renfrew Educational Services. She's had the privilege of working full time on the Stony Nakoda First Nation through Stony Health Services since 2018. As a pediatric dietitian, she works closely with children and families in the community and as well as the Nakoda Elementary School and Morley Community School. So a big welcome to Lindsay McCharles and whenever you feel ready, you can start your presentation. Awesome, thank you. I will just share my screen here. I just have a couple pictures to share. Yep, you're up, Lindsay. Okay. It's working now? Yes. Okay, perfect. So um, yeah, my name's Lindsay and um, just a little bit of background on the community and myself. So the Stony Dakota First Nation is located about uh, 50 kilometers west of Calgary between Calgary and Canmore just off and around Highway 1 and 
um, the community has two schools that are situated on reserve, the Nakota Elementary School and the Morley Community School, and each have about 300 to 500 students enrolled um, at the school. Both schools have a hot lunch program um, as from my experience standard on, on reserve, and that includes breakfast, lunch, and two snacks. So about 50 to 60% of the child's intake in any given week. Um, both schools have that industrial kitchen as well as their own cooks from the community that prepare the meals for the students. Um, so my role is through Stony Hill Services and Renfrew Educational Services. Renfrew is my employer and they're an agency based out of Calgary, but we've been contracted on Nation for the last um, two and a half years. And in my role, I get to do both clinical and population health. Um, so that's both some counseling one-on-one -on -one with families, as well as working in the community setting and running a handful of and a wide variety of programs. Um, we work very, very closely with our community health promoters, um, which are a part uh, and very key um, part of our, uh, our nutrition team. So to start off some of our nutrition programs, so what we have and what we run is called the Healthy Eating Initiative, um, which is run by myself, as well as another second dietitian we have on reserve. Her name's Paige Thompson, who's covering for a mat leave of Myra Regan, who really, Myra was the one who secured a lot of our funding back in October of 2018. So it was right around when I was starting the position. Um, so the three of us now work with four community health promoters. We have um, Josh Mark, Kiana Daniels, Japheth Coquitz and Meldrick Bigstoney, and they're all from the community um, and work quite closely with their community. Um, focusing on the school programs that we run is the images that and the programs I was going to highlight today, but there are a, a variety of other things we do around food security and just like diabetes and adult chronic disease management promotion, things like that. Um, so the basis of all of our programs are based um, kind of to use this West Stitch Healthy Living Guide that we have created. So this was created right at the start of our funding um, and it was created with community elders. So Myra and I had seen Sutena First Nation, which is located right on the border of Calgary, um, create their own healthy living guide as well, what they call the Guja. And it is created, it looks like a honeycomb. So we thought maybe with Turtle Island being like a significant story, we could make something similar to this honeycomb, but make it a turtle. And um, when we brought our elders into a, like a focus group kind of learning session, our elders were like, when was the last time you saw a turtle in Morley? No one's gonna relate to this turtle idea that you guys have. So they wanted, they suggested the TV, which is definitely a much more appropriate and relatable. Um, image for the, the community and they're for focusing on the young and the youth to relate to. And then we've um, built in Canada's food guide as well as some other um, key factors in health for the community. So that being like the family support um, within the teepee, in the door of the teepee, as well as community and tradition as the flags at the top of the teepee being like those really staples in health and wellness in the community. Um, after Canada's food guide was updated in February of 2019, we added in the plate method at the bottom since that's really the focus around, um, around nutrition recommendations federally right now. And then as well as how important and key it is for access to medical equipment for the community, which can be a barrier for a lot of people's health. So once we created this West Stitch with our um, elder, community elders, we've used it and integrated it into a number of our programs, especially our school food programs. Um, so these are a couple of our community health promoters. Last Christmas, we've had two others join the team. Um, so we, myself and Paige, are pictured here and we work quite closely with them on a daily basis. Uh, so the first program I wanted to talk about was our NSTEP program. So NSTEP is um, across Alberta, and BC in specific school divisions or specific schools. And it stands for Nutrition Students, Teachers, ec uh, Exercising with Parents. And um, we worked with Deb Heimer, similar. She's worked with the Sutena First Nation to um, really personalize it to the community. And it's not really the same that end step would be in the um, city setting, but it's very, the, the 
fundamental curriculum pieces are still there, but personalized to the community. So what we have done is create our end step activity books. Um, this program is focused at the elementary school, which is K to six. So starting with kindergarten, we've now completed through COVID, it was kind of our work from home project, all six of our activity books, um, which starts with introducing our was stitch, which is that living guide. So it goes through it um, and introduced to the character. And then we have our um, level or grade one, which is learning from the animals. And again, one of our other characters, Snow and Sky are their names. And then caring for mother earth, which is the grade two. We're starting to call them levels instead of grades. And then um, level four is caring for my body, back to sky. And level five is diving deeper into carbohydrates. And then level six, we are with Snow again, and she introduces diabetes and diabetes prevention. So each of these um, books have a number of Stony words that we've used with the Stony teachers at the high, at the um, elementary school. So for example, to know is meat. Um, Ina Makachi is Mother Earth in the Stony language. So the Stony teacher really integrated and advanced based on whatever grade level the Stony language in the books. And then um, all the drawings that you see, like all the characters were completely drawn by a community member. Um, his name is, is Keanu to young men and he's kind of our go-to cartoonist. So he has done such an awesome job creating these or bringing these characters to life. And then um, there's a number of different activities throughout each book as well. So that might be um, drawing our plates at breakfast, lunch and dinner, or it might be going outside and finding um, animal tracks or different parts of nature, depending on the grade level and what they kind of do in different curriculums. So that kind of, it takes that end step where it's um, not just health class, but it's really curriculum based and puts them in an activity books that um, we're able to take some of the load off the teachers and they can just kind of go through the books with their students and with our health promoters. So end steps a super fun activity that we do on a monthly basis. Um, Obviously with uh, the pandemic, we've had to change things. Our community is taking a very strong approach in protecting our elders. So we are not following the Alberta education um, scenario one kind of setup. We're, we're in more of a scenario two. So the kids were in two cohorts um, and going to school two days a week. And then about 50% of the students are still opting to do just virtual online. So the schools are very um, quiet right now and a lot of it's taken virtually. So our community health promoters, this is Josh, he goes and each month we record him reading a couple pages of the story and then our other health promoters jump in and do the activity so the students can follow along and it's all posted to their Google classrooms. So they're able to do end step that way this year. Um, so it's different, but it's also super fun. One of our other major programs is our healthy food bags. So this is, um, where we come together and pack up a bunch of, I guess, HelloFresh style bags. But before we send it home, each of the classrooms comes to the kitchen and does the hands-on cooking piece with us and samples the food. And that way they get to know if they like it or how they might wanna alter it. They get to learn those food skills, those food handler skills. And um, they get to really take the lead and have that responsibility piece of cooking this meal when they take it home to their families. So, um, yeah, this program runs for grade threes through grade nine. So we do go over into the junior high, high school age um, to deliver this program. And here's a, one of our, I think this is our grade four classroom from last Christmas. And they got, last Christmas, I think we did a ham or pork tenderloin and they kind of did it in a cranberry sauce. And always we always try to f try something new each month. Um, so then they take home, at the end of the day, they get these bags with the frozen meat and take it on the bus and take it right home. So it's great. And the kids I think have learned a lot um, around food literacy and those food handler kind of skills. Um, yeah, so that's a super awesome one that we run for four months. We're still figuring out how it might be able to look with COVID-19 and it'll just be, a, we're hoping to start in January. So we're just waiting to see what things look like in January. Um, 
The next one that I wanted to highlight was our food forest um, and community greenhouse. So our food forest, um, you can see kind of in the background, we have, I think, nine beds out here, as well as um, surrounding the playground, uh, many perennial plants. Um, so that's pretty much every berry plant that can grow in our environment. Um, there's an apple tree, a pear tree, a crab apple tree, some herbs, and then we get to do the annual stuff in the beds there. And then we do also have a community greenhouse that we do two programs out of this. So, yeah, so we do a little bit of work um, with some of the classrooms, the grade four and grade seven classrooms are kind of our target um, audience for getting this, our seedling started and doing all the work before they go on summer vacation. And with COVID, they did some of their own gardening at home that their teacher took the initiative in doing. And then we just kind of um, did what we could with our community garden and greenhouse this year. Our focus for this is definitely increasing community engagement. And that's our food forest. This one here was only opened in July of 2019. So it's only been a little over a year. And so some people or much of the community doesn't even know that this space exists and that it's open and it's theirs to care for and utilize the harvest and everything. Um, so definitely moving forward, this program is a focus that needs some love and attention and um, really giving that capacity piece back to the community where they can use these spaces to um, increase local food and their own skills around all of this. Um, yeah, and then the last thing that we do work with the schools a little bit with is um, around menu planning. So the high school, this we kind of have taken the initiative to build relationships with the schools, but we let the cooks reach out to us when they want to do stuff. So right now there's no students in the schools on Fridays. So we're working with our high school cooks and trying to make homemade granola bars and homemade muffins and homemade different types of like, primarily the focus is healthy snacks for their hot lunch program. And we'll do a little bit of menu planning work with them as well. That pretty much wraps up my involvement with the school food programs. Um, and yeah, I'm happy to chat if or answer any questions at the end. Awesome, thank you for that presentation and sharing all of those wonderful resources. Um, our next presenter is Clifford Gledew. He is a member of the Whitefish Lake First Nation 459, and he's the food services manager for the Kitaskinao Tribal, Edu Tribal Council Education Authority. The authority oversees six schools within Whitefish Lake First Nation, Woodland Cree First Nation, Lubicon Lake Band, Loon River First Nation, and Peerless Trout First Nation. He's helped the six schools to eliminate processed foods and has helped turn a vision to offer traditional meals in school into a reality. He's worked, they've worked with elders in the community as well as public health officers. Thank you for being here, Clifford. And whenever you feel ready, you can start your presentation. Okay, can you guys see that? We yeah. can, Clifford, you're good to go. Okay. Yeah, my name is Clifford Gladzi. I'm the food services. Sure, I think you're um, cutting out. First Clifford. formed, they are. Uh, they didn't have no food service program. So a year after it was formed, they um, they came to me and asked me for help because I, I had worked in other places like just restaurants. So it, it, the KTC was formed through the leaders, vision of the leadership and the elders. The First Nation schools in Canada to offer traditional food. Well, um, this took me about, I'd say about nine months to get this going. Like we were able to work with uh, the public health officers at the, uh, of Indigenous Service Canada. And we uh, took control of the, our uh, delivery. And then that there, I couldn't um, take control of what was coming in and put, because I wanted the freshness of the produce and the meat. So, so we took over the system. And when we first started, we purchased the, 
a delivery truck. And then um, we started getting. Um, I see that uh, earlier Susan asked, uh, I think it was during Scott's presentation, she asked uh, um, who, who helped pack the boxes for the program, Scott? Or if you want to jump in, Susan, and ask your question yourself as well. Yeah, I wanted to know when you said that the boxes were packed, who did the boxes, Scott? Uh, it was a collaborative effort between the Four Nations and, and MESC, Muscatrice Education Schools Commission. So we had 22 staff members in our department it was staff that, um, that, that assisted, but uh, only where needed. So our team, we were able to really train them and, and our, our guys, were, our, our people were really efficient at packing boxes. But some of the other nations, they, they wanted to do their own um, own thing. So we, we supported them and we, we, we sometimes helped them uh, yeah, yeah. at boxes, portion boxes, but uh, it, was mostly, it was mostly the nations that did the packing, but uh, periodically our team jumped in and like we were really like, a, like a, an elite force of hamper production. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, I had another question. Are the resources that okay. were mentioned earlier available online or how do you, uh, that's it's for Lindsay. Susan, the resources are not currently online anywhere, although our health center website was um, just updated. So I know they do want us to put a lot of these up on there. They are just not uploaded yet, but I would be happy to share electronic they're versions of them. Resources. My goodness, they are terrific. Yeah, they're, they're super bright and colorful and beautiful and the artists are so talented. Thank you. Lindsay, would you be comfortable with us sending it out through like our newsletter or um, like through our GFSA network to um, different members? Yeah, yeah, awesome. that's for sure. I am, um, they are quite tailored to the Stony First Nation, but I'm sure there's great um, opportunities to collaborate and utilize them in different ways. So I'd be awesome. happy to share. Thanks. Okay. Uh, one question I wanted to ask um, was um, what are some challenges in developing and starting up these programs and as well as maintaining them in the indigenous communities? And this is open to anybody <laughs> on the- I think I is. While Clifford's still setting that up, um, if Scott or Lindsay, if you wanna speak on that question. Sure. Um, <clears throat> one of the biggest hurdles in starting a, a program <clears throat> like a universal school food strategy in our communities is um, paradigm shifts. Uh, so when I, when I say that, I mean uh, the staff and the students and the parents and the leaders in the community all have an opinion about food and what food is and, and what we should be providing our students. And it, it takes time for people to learn the facts, right? So um, there, there's an easy way of feeding kids and then there's a more challenging, better way, more nutritionally dense way. And that takes some time to, to change paradigms, right? So um, when we first introduced the salad bars, people said, there's too much waste, this isn't gonna work. You're not gonna get these kids to eat healthy food. So when we first introduced the salad bars, people were critical of them that they wouldn't be effective. And it just, it's a matter of time. It's like advertising, right? So it's the same principle of, uh, of uh, exposure to healthy food over time changes paradigms. So uh, just the, the visual experience of seeing healthy food in a salad bar on a day-to-day -day basis will uh, change the mindset of, of young people. Um, and also the staff that are involved in it. They, they start to see, well, it does work. Like when, and so it's, it's really that it was the most challenging part is, is um, getting people on board with, with um, changing the nature of where we get our food from. So we're not buying from Cisco and GFS convenience foods anymore. We're making everything from scratch with whole ingredients that are grown mostly locally as possible. And that's, so logistical challenges and and changing mindsets in the communities um but it can be it can be done everywhere um it's not just indigenous communities where we have these challenges mm -hmm. um but 
they, they're definitely over, uh, um, easily overcome with tenacity. Yeah. God, I kind of have a building question on that, I guess, like any wisdom or insight in like kind of how to bridge that. Cause I know like myself and in our community, we feel that now, like with some of the programs we look to introduce, there's resistance because of waste um, or like con great concern around waste. So how do you kind of like allow them to s visually see, see that for and expose and market it for a period of time before you get that buy-in? Was there like steps you took to reduce food waste or? Uh, yeah, so it's initially you have to work with everybody. So it's really, it's you take the criticisms in and then you address them professionally and say, listen, listen, we're all on the same page. We, we, we want, this is the end goal and we, we don't know how to get there exactly, but we're gonna work together and make it, make it work. So um, essentially going, coming down with, this is a vision of what we want and we don't know how to get there, but that's what we have to do. We have to get like Susan's four principles. I think it was four or five principles of what a universal school food strategy should be. They're, they're vague in their, uh, uh, like they're kind of general, but uh, in their application, but they're very specific in their vision, right? So if you go, go to a community and say, this is the ultimate goal is to feed students healthy, nutrient dense food every single day. Well, how do we get from here where we are to there? And it'll look different in every community, but it's a collaborative, right? So it's not shutting out these people who have concerns, it's involving them in the conversation about a solution, not spending too much time on the problem, but just say, okay, I, I understand where you're coming from, but how do we get there then? What are your suggestions? And then invite them into that conversation. I'd also just like to double check with Clifford if um, if he's feeling ready to present more of the audience questions. Yeah, go ahead, Zee. So um, we have one to ask for both Scott and Lindsay, if do you have a steady and secure source of funding and do you worry about sustainability over the next three to five years or are you feeling more hopeful over time? Um, our funding has come from a variety of places. Oh. I'm hopeful in that there are lots of streams and avenues to access funding. Um, it's definitely looking better and better each year. Uh, we, our largest chunk of funding does come from Jordan's principal, which we have been grateful for and have really utilized. Um, and it has opened so many doors and opportunities like creating these resources. So I think there is some changes going on within Jordan's principle, but at the end of the day, we are fairly confident in the programs that we run and that our funding will be renewed year after year. What principle did you mention? Jordan's principle. Okay, good, thank you. So Jordan's principle is a federally funded initiative um, it's a child's first initiative that prioritizes um, Indigenous children having right to funding no matter where it's supposed to come. I know. So it's from a family or a child in Manitoba named Jordan River Anderson, who basically his quality of life was quite compromised because of the inability of the provincial and federal government to agree on who should be paying for his health care. So now this mandate has come across that Jordan's principle funding will cover it and um, after the fact it's worked out who it is that's actually paying for it be it provincial or federal um, so it's a very large um, fund that comes down from Ottawa and I think someone in Laura White in the chat shared I would expect it to be a link to more information on Jordan's principle um, and it, from my understanding it's been in effect since about 2015 through 2017 was kind of when it started up and now it's got the ball rolling. Can I just mention some uh, items regarding um, funding? Uh, in the beginning of our school food program, it was because our principal at the time at the one school, Ermanskin Junior Senior High School, was, he was a new principal and he was worried about running out of money. So they had about $70,000 left in March 1st, at the beginning of the new fiscal year. And so they basically invested it for the following year's school food program. And, um, and at that time, Indigenous students across Canada were getting a fraction of like 
two thirds of what a public school student would receive in terms of nominal role uh, and how schools are funded, right? And it wasn't until <clears throat> two years ago that the province of Alberta under the NDP decided to top up school funding to match public schools, but we were still running a school food program with no extra grants using education dollars. It was just priorities. The community prioritized it. So right out the, right out the gate, the money didn't go to the band and then go through the band filter. It went to the school board. It went directly from INAC to the school board. And then the school board said, we were gonna prioritize feeding the kids. So they gave us a budget which worked out to about a dollar a day for food costs, not including operational costs at this point. It wasn't until we expanded to uh, um, 11 schools across a whole district that we needed operational costs and include operational costs. So we calculated that, but it's still part of the education dollars that we're getting. We're not getting additional funding or grants. I just wanted to say that. Yeah, creating school menus, uh... I partnered with the cooks from each school of the six schools. Um, I gathered all their menus and we went over the menus. What what I wanted to do was um, remove all the processed foods for the menu. So, but what we did was we slowly elim eliminated things. It took about two years to eliminate all eliminate all the processed foods on the menu. And none of the schools had a breakfast program. So what I did was I, I brought in a breakfast program for each school. And we usually serve that between 8.30 and 9 o'clock. So that gives time for each student that comes to school late because we start school at 8.50. So we try to feed everybody as, as much as we can. Can you... Go to land-based learning camps. In the land-based learning camps, we take each class from each school. So, so like we have six schools, so we take grade fives and grade sixes together. Here at this camp, they learn how to hunt and skin. Um, the What they learn to skin, there's a moose, deer, duck rabbit and fish we have um we usually bring in elders from each community to come help teach the kids the students also learn the need to provide for themselves in the future at these camps they also the elders also tell stories to the students in, in camps so you could see some kids there doing the the moose hide and those students there, they really enjoyed doing that. And they, they didn't want to leave the camps because the camps are usually about five days. So we had a hard time getting some students to leave the camp to go back to their schools and go home. And go to the next slide. <clears throat> Is this the right one, Clifford? Yeah. The Alberta First Nations Food Sovereignty Declaration. Um, uh, one of my elders had gave me this, this form, this paper that the Alberta First Nations Food Sovereignty Declaration, where wild game is recognized source of traditional food, cultural en en enrichment and nutrition. So I had spoke to eight elders about the food sovereignty declaration and i told them that i wanted to um bring this forward to ktcea to the school because <clears throat> i wanted to start um feeding traditional foods in the schools so all those elders were on board and then we presented it to the the board members so all the board members were in agreement so they told me to start working on this uh, traditional foods in schools. So we formed a little group with the elders and some leadership from each community. So <clears throat> go to the next slide. 
the community program? Yep. <clears throat> so with this community program, we uh, had to receive consent from leadership and elders per community to provide uninspected wild game on the menu. So, so what we did was um, we went to each First Nation. We met with the leadership, the chief and council, and each community had their own elders senate. So we spoke with them, and they they told me to go ahead with this uninspected unex, uh, wild game to be on the menu. So what we for a wild game, what we only been getting was the moose. With the other wild game, such as um, bison, elk, uh, deer, fish, we brought that in with um, our partner, uh, Northern Food Service, and they get that from the Calgary area. So they partnered with somebody from Calgary. So we get the wild game through them. Is we What we had was... Um, Gordon Food Service and Cisco, but they couldn't provide the provide the wild game. So I started shopping around for another food provider that could help us out in that area. So Northern Food Service had a partnership with Denon Day from Northwest Territories. So we fall under Denon Day because that, that was um, a First Nations company. So they helped us get the wild game. So the wild game should be processed and prepared at an um, has been inspected by and approved by environmental public health officers. So each school had to get their kitchens inspected and they had to provide where they were going to store their wild game in the coolers. So before, when they did that, they got a certificate of approval for handling the wild game. So that certificate approval was the first of its kind in Canada. So they had to post that up in their um, kitchens where everybody could see it. Next slide. So we had to create forms for the hunters. This form, it, it helped us to know who had killed the moose and where it was um, killed, they had to provide their status card number, their um, and what zone they killed the moose, and the temperature of the moose. They had to write that down. So this this form, when they fill it out, it was only for the KTC file that that this form was never shared with anybody else. So the hunter information was there. They had to provide their name. The hunter number is the, the person that went out. So say if I went out, that would be hunter number one. And the H1, it would be the hunter number one. And if they provide one or two moves, they put H101 or H102. So the, they have to provide the phone and the community they're from, their treaty number, the address, the hunting area, the hunting date, the harvest time, the outdoor temperature, and the type of animal, and the male or female. Next slide. So this is how our labeling information was put on our um, packaged meat that was on it and inspected. So they have to put the carcass number and the hunter number on it, the type of animal, and the date of harvest. So there's an example there. It says KTC EA H101 on inspected moose meat. And the date it was harvested was September 5th, 2020. <clears throat> Receiver and stores. This is where once they kill that moose, they would have to bring it to our warehouse where I would inspect it. So the, um, the hunter would have to bring it, and I give this give this form to them to fill it out. Because um, sometimes their forms wouldn't be accurate, like not, not the same. 
and the number of packets of meat that they brought in. So we really have to keep track of how much meat comes in wild game. So the name of receiver inspector, that would be me once I receive it. Sometimes, there are a couple of times I've had to reject the meat. But when I reject the meat, they, they would um, either give it to the elders or, or they would keep it. Because there's a certain way they would have to um, cut the meat for the schools. So, and then declaration and agreement is where they have to go through each step and check mark the box that they have done. So they would sign it and then I would sign it. The next slide. The school information form. Is this, this is for the school. Once we, um, when it's time for traditional meals, I would um, send the meat three days before the traditional meal day. So the driver would have to fill out the, the form of the meat they got at the warehouse and they would have to provide the date they picked up and the time they picked up. And then they'll take it to the school and the head cook would have to fill out the school facility area of the time it was received. So the next slide. <clears throat> See, that's how it looks when it's, it's a little bigger. So the name of the dri delivery driver, the time they left the facility, and the address, and the school name. The, uh, some of the cooks were really on board with this because they said that there was too much paperwork, but I need to keep track of everything because I had to send all these paperwork to Indigenous Service Canada, because this was a, a pilot project that we had started last year. So, and there's a, our last slide is there's, there's a moose to encourage our children to have dreams, to expose them to the possibilities through education. That's my slide. Thanks, Clifford. Thank you so much, Clifford. I know there was so much technical adversity, but I'm really glad we got to hear your presentation. I had no idea about the all the processes involved in getting uh, wild meat and game uh, game meat to schools. So thank you so much for that. Um, I want to let everyone know that um, all of the other sessions have been delayed to 11:10. So if you have any questions for any of the panel members, you guys can still ask. Um, yeah. And then um, something I might ask to all of the panel members is what is an area, if there is an area um, then in your school community that you would want to change in terms of allowing your school food program to be more successful, what would it be? And it can be from like any angle, any aspect. Um, yeah. I just have a quick question for Clifford, if I may. I'll go ahead. Uh, Clifford, how much wild meat were you able to integrate into your program this year? Uh, this year we were limited because of uh, COVID. So there was a lot of hunters that didn't really want to go out there. So we were having trouble getting um, moose meat in for this um, the school year. Mm -hmm. Okay. So about, <clears throat> I'd say about this year we had about um, probably about four so far, four moose. Mm -hmm. Cool, and well, that's a significant amount of protein for the program. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, on that kind of building on Zaheen's question, we are working with Clifford and last year we had approached our board of elders, our, our circle of elders with, um, with Clifford's model of wild meats integration into school food. And it was approved. And about the same day we were talking about COVID. <laughs> so it, 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 it's all been delayed um, because of this, but we, we did get a, a vacuum pack machine and we're ready to start, you know, doing our, doing what Cliff is doing. But 
That's what that's what we'd like to change to our program. That's one of the changes that are coming up. Awesome. I just also want to point out that uh, the implementation of, of wild game into school foods is a, is a huge, huge benefit to Indigenous communities because uh, in some areas, uh, not only is it uh, important for nutrition and health and the animals are medicine, but it's uh, it's just been denied for generations and it's just nice to see it that it's a welcoming addition to the program i absolutely agree i think when i went to school and i remember that being one of the highlights is being able to have you know food from the land that we prepared ourselves and that was so so special Uh, I'd like to, if, if anybody needs to get going to another session, they can go, or if you have more questions, we can stay for a bit longer. Um, for those of you that have to leave, um, I hope you enjoy the rest of the sessions and um, have a great day. Um, thank you all, for, all, thank you to all of the panelists who come. I know you guys have really busy schedules, so thank you for coming down to present. And um, I guess if there's like a last minute question um, for anybody in the audience, um, feel free to ask, you can unmute yourself. There is a question in the chat, Zaheen. Terry's asking Clifford, is there any opportunity to purchase wild meat for people outside of your community? Uh, no, because we're not allowed to do that right now. But you could purchase um, bison and uh, elk and deer through Northern Food Service, and they would be able to help you. But as for KTCEA, we were not allowed to do that. Thanks, Clifford. Okay. If there's not any other audience questions, I think we can wrap it up. Sorry, Clifford, I, I should, sorry to interrupt. What was the oh, name of ahead. that company? Uh, Northern Food Service. And they're based out of Northwest Territories? Uh, they have an office in uh, Edmonton. Northern Food Service. Yeah, but their head office is uh, in Yellowknife. Okay, and they have a distribution point in Edmonton then? Yes, they do. Okay, and it's elk, deer, and what else did you say? Uh, bison, and they have all kinds of salmon also. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. All right. If there's no other questions, then I think we can end the session here. And again, again, a big thank you to everybody for coming out tonight.